Hello, I'm Nathan Carlin. This is Life and Work. Life and Work is a series where we talk to scholars and intellectuals about the connections between their public scholarship and their personal lives. Life and Work is supported by the McGovern Center for Humanities and Ethics. Today on Life and Work, we have Dr. Keith Meder. He's a professor at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And he's there. He's the director of the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Society. Tell me about where, where did you grow up? Where are you from? I grew up in Kentucky and uh, was there until I went to undergraduate school at Vanderbilt. Went to undergrad at, at Vanderbilt. And did you always know that you wanted a, a life in medicine? Actually, my, uh, my aspirations and decision to go into medicine very related to uh, a local physician. I grew up in a small town. Yeah. Small town of about 5,000, Scottsville, Kentucky. Uh -huh. And uh, home to Dollar General. This is one claim to fame. Oh, wow. And, um, Dollar General. And there yeah. was a, a local physician, John Hall. John Hall, yeah. Who um, I was very much kind of mm -hmm. part of his household. He, his oldest daughter was one of my best friends. And we wow. they, they had five, and five children. And it was just a fun ho home to be in. It was Spent a lot of time there uh, as an adolescent, this kind of thing. And uh, in knowing him, hmm. watching him, and uh, seeing what he what he meant to the community in some oh, ways, mm -hmm. I, uh, I started thinking, I, I, I want to be a doc. Wow. I want to be a physician. Yeah. This, yeah. Is, this, this is what fits uh, with sort of my sense of, of mm -hmm. values and purpose and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So went to undergrad uh, at Vanderbilt uh, from as a uh, as a pre med, and um, was looking toward medical school and thought I, I took undergrad I took a number of uh, humanities type courses a lot of history mm -hmm. along with all the pre med requirements as an undergraduate, but then uh, and and actually had interest also in areas of religion and theology and some mm -hmm. of these kinds of things. But, uh, but stay true to the course of, 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 uh, of pre-medical uh, curriculum. And then, uh, for financial reasons, went back to medical school in Kentucky mm -hmm. and uh, went to the University of Louisville, uh, where, oh, John, okay. where Dr. Yeah. Hall had gone. In my mind, it was, it's, yeah. it was kind of amusing. I don't mean this badly toward the University of Kentucky. But, yeah. uh, but I, it's, uh, University of Kentucky was a newer medical school then. Those were the two state schools. And, I, um, and actually, UK... Uh, Accepted me without an interview, so I thought they must not, they must be, need, they must be needing people. So I, and plus John Hall well, had gone to Louisville, so I went to U of L, went back to U of L to medical school. Okay, yeah, and um, mm -hmm. so and that was and you know all, all the while kind of to be honest with you at that point in my life thinking I would go back to Scottsville as a primary care type sure. physician. That was my vision of who I would be. And he was, I assume he's family medicine physician. Yes, family, yeah. family yeah. medicine doc in and, yeah. and that small town. And, yeah. and I mean, the plan in many ways was for me to go back. Right. And, and, uh, yeah. and to this, um, he's deceased now and mm. it was very dear to me. And I was involved, spoke at his funeral, this kind of thing. He was that close to me and I and love his family dearly. And But I, um, it was... Somewhat of a feeling of letting him down when I didn't go back. Oh, so that was one of those uh, those sort of he, he yeah. understood, but yeah. And yeah. then when I became a psychiatrist, that really was disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> he thought yeah. I was going to be a real doctor. <laughs> well, well, how did how yeah how did you, that shift happen for you? Well, I was as a uh, when I was in medical school, and and as I said, I'm kind yeah. of anticipating the potential to go. Mm -hmm. I did, during that period of time, marry my first wife, who's uh, deceased now. Mm -hmm. But um, So Patricia and I had been undergraduates at Vanderbilt together. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and she was a nurse who then ultimately went on to law school. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but we got married during medical school. Mm -hmm. uh, she actually uh, spent a summer working as a nurse in the local community hospital wow. between when she uh, was working in intensive care at Louisville and then started law school. So we had a great summer. I'll mm -hmm. never forget that summer in, in Scottsville. And at that junction, uh, we were still thinking about, didn't know what to, I was going to do exactly. But during, so, so but still thinking about the possibility of coming back to South Central Kentucky. And then, uh, but I got to know Wayne Oates. Mm -hmm. Wayne Oates uh, it was, a, is a, was a pastoral theologian, mm -hmm. but was a full professor of psychiatry at oh. University of Louisville. Okay. Wayne okay. had been at Southern Seminary 
as was part of a long history of, of teaching pastoral theology, pastoral care, and counseling at Southern Seminary there in Louisville. Mm -hmm. But then due to things going on there at the seminary, etc., he ended up uh, being invited to be a full... So he was a full tenured professor of psychiatry. Amazing. In the medical school yeah. at Louisville. And so, um, so... And with my interest that I did have in religion and theology, and I've been pretty actively reading those kind of things and studying those during undergraduate years, that kind of thing, I... Um, I got in touch with him, mm -hmm. uh, set up to have an elective with him. Uh, and uh, Was this a, a fourth-year elective? No, or, this or? was really, I started this when, I, the, the dates I can't remember exactly, when, but I started earlier in medical, medical school. I, I mm, kind of okay. got in touch with him, yeah. like a, something like a second-year student or something, mm -hmm. back then mm -hmm. when I was still in the basic sciences, but I made a connection with him mm -hmm. due to uh, knowing that he was there. And then we established where it was really a long time, over a couple of years, I kept kind of mm. working with him. And it was mm. very much in a mentorship type role, a, a golden opportunity in my life. I, could, I, yeah. I, I, I truly happened into it and could not, could not have planned it. But I, I, to this day, I say that even though I needed to go back to Kentucky and to Louisville for financial reasons for medical school, mm -hmm. it was very much a gift to me mm -hmm. to go mm -hmm. back and get uh, connected to Wayne. Wayne yeah. It made all the difference in what I do to this day. Wow. So, um, so, but the opportunity to study with Wayne, but it wasn't just studying with him, it was really watching him. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. was seeing how he thought about mental health mm -hmm. and how he thought about the role of those who, chaplains and those who were trained in, uh, in the study of religion and theology mm -hmm. to be part of mental health mm -hmm. that, uh, that formed me in many ways. And so, uh, so it was really through conversations with Wayne and starting to realize, oh, so this is a way that I could bring together my interest in humanities and religion, etc., hmm. with medicine was through the lens of psychiatry. I, I, I was actually very naive about what psychiatry was. As I, mean, I yeah. m, as I said, my lens for medicine was family doc, a family doctor yeah. and family medicine. So I really had no other framework at that point in time. I had never really been exposed to psychiatry at all. And I actually refused to take any psychology courses as an undergraduate. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I, I, had a good, I just thought, no, yeah. I don't want that. Yeah, and so uh, so, but through Wayne is how I really got to yeah. start to think about. Oh, so this is where I could find a junction yeah. for my interest in medicine and my commitments to uh, religion, theology, theological studies, and the humanities. Yeah, it's really interesting. So it's this mentor, John Hall, family physician in your hometown, early mentor, that's sort of inspiring you to sort of go to medical school. You go to Vanderbilt. You. Um, are on the pre-med track, but it's still a very much a liberal arts experience where you're interested in religion, history, theology, these types of things. And so then you go to Louisville for medical school, like John Hall did. You meet um, Wayne Oates. So it's a way of sort of continuing or stitching together your previous kind of identity. You take this elective early in medical school that's really formative, can you can can you tell me what it's what that elective was like? Like, what did you do? Like, it really, it really was an example of he he had a couple of patients yeah. that were seeing him mm -hmm. in some role and and how that was worked out. Clint Wayne had an outpatient clinic. Okay, so it's outpatient. He had an outpatient yeah. clinic. He yeah, had an outpatient yeah. clinic yeah. at Louisville, which was really at that time. I mean, this was a long time. <laughs> this was forty <laughs> years ago. Uh, yeah. That was pretty distinctive yeah. in some ways, I think, uh, so to have that in the heart of a medical center. Mm -hmm. So, but he had an outpatient clinic uh, he, uh, there within the outpatient, without in the outpatient psychiatric clinic. He had uh, a clinic and and mm -hmm. had other and supervisees that he worked with, and so he uh, set, set up set up to supervise me. Mm -hmm. As a medical student, mm -hmm. in seeing these uh, these persons, wow! And yeah, so I yeah. would have supervision with him, see mm -hmm. the the mm -hmm. you know, thanks be to God for the opportunity for the willingness of people to see a medical student. I yeah. Mean, I, so you were right there a, in the room with them. Yeah. I was their yeah. I was their doctor. Oh, <laughs> you were their doctor. I was. They and, were. Yeah. And, and then we would talk about. <laughs> yeah. No, I would be. Yeah. See, I was yeah. who saw them. Yeah. And then he would supervise wow. me later. About the conversation. Yes, exactly. But wow. but yeah. I was 
And and I think that captured my imagination too. Yeah. It's like these were the first people yeah. that were my quote patients. That's amazing. And so it was yeah. a real opportunity yeah. Yeah. to and, and his tr- I, I treasure his trust in me. I mean that was a gift that he but but and we would talk through them and yeah. you know and, and process them in in supervision later. But he but no, I was the only one in the room with it, and we would be sorting through sort of the things they had come to, yeah. to see him about. And um, so anyway, great opportunity. First, so these were my first patients, and so and through that lens, I started to see psychiatry as yeah, that's where I want. This is what I'm made for. Made was to be yeah, yeah. Was for something. It for seems psychiatry. like today. I mean that. I mean, I, it's hard for me to imagine a medical student sort of doing that today. I know. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I know. And it, was I, it rare then too, or? I don't know. Yeah. I honest. I mean, the truth is, Nate. I don't know the yeah. degree to which that would have been occurring otherwise. It just was your experience. I think it, it was yeah. just what I was. What he made the yeah. window for me to do. I don't. Yeah. I mean, he was not doing this with other students. Either. I know that he would. I yeah. know there were no other students who had requested that. It was yeah. a very specific elective that I had the privilege to do with him. Yeah. So he wasn't. He wasn't doing this with anyone else, and so right. it was a unique opportunity for me, a distinctive opportunity for me to have that with him at that point. I mean, that makes perfect sense why you would fall in love with psychiatry then, you know, to have that kind of opportunity. So then I, I can see your, your sights, you know, now you want to become a psychiatrist and you go to Duke for residency. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. that's, that's correct. I, mm-hmm. I was, I'm, I was from the South and I, my, when I, at that point in time, when I looked at the horizon of psychiatry training, psychiatric residencies, training programs across the southeast, Duke was really the best one. I mean, Duke had a, a history was that was quite significant, and um, and there was really no, no other really comparable programs from what I could assess and when I mm-hmm. talked to friends and people uh, in that regard. So I, I looked at Duke, I interviewed, and I really made the decision. Back then, the match wasn't quite as rigid, mm-hmm. so there was a little more of an ability to say, I like you, you like me, we've got a deal. And so you still did the match, but you could work, you could make commitments outside the match back then. Oh, okay. So I yeah. I sort of stip- and that was when I stipulated that I wanted to use a we had a, at that time we had a year of elective time in the residency program at Duke, and so I stipulated that I wanted to use a, my elective time to do a theological study at the Divinity School, mm. and so that's when I did that. I was I and and we established that commitment. Uh, actually, Jack Rhodes uh, was wonderful. He was the training director at that time. Even <laughs> put up with my wanting to get that in writing. Yeah. So I did get that in writing that I yeah. could uh, use yeah. my elective time in the Divinity School. So, That's uh, amazing. And so, um, why why do you feel like doing a um, a master's in theology during residency? Why was that important for you? Would you say? You know, I, I really. I mean, that's a great question, Nate. And I, I think. Uh, and I, and, I, and I give Wayne credit for this in ways, too, that I learned enough with him that I, I, I think it was very clear to me that, uh, that, the, that I wanted to do theological study. Mm-hmm. I'd done a lot of my own reading. I, I, mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I'd had a class at Vanderbilt as an undergraduate. I'll never forget, an important class for me on intellectual history mm-hmm. in which I'd read Augustine and I'd read, you know, started mm-hmm. to dabble with Aquinas. I mean, you know, I'd started to mm-hmm. look at some things that, uh, that were informative and, and important for my sort of intellectual uh, sort of development along those lines. But, uh, but I was aware, I, I really need to study. So I need to do some theological work, study and work um, versus the sort of tendency that was out there to say, well, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a Christian, I come from the Christian tradition, and to just say, well, I'm a Christian and I'll be a psychiatrist, that's enough. Mm-hmm. I knew I wanted more than that. Mm-hmm. I knew that, and I needed more than that mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. be as thoughtful as I uh, hoped to be at these intersections that Wayne had introduced me to, mm-hmm. of these intersections of, of uh, psychology, psychiatry, and uh, mental health. and, uh, and Yeah, so I, I, it, it seems like you were on some sort of um, intellectual quest where you have mentors who are very important to you, John Hall, Wayne Oates, and um, you wanted to continue these things, and this course in intellectual history made you see that you, you couldn't just slap the word Christian on psychiatry or, or something like right. that. Well, you, you, right. you were looking for more depth. Well, that's well said. No, you know? I really, I did feel like I needed more. And I, and I, and I thought 
and I really believe and do to this day that it was important to give some intentional study yeah uh, and intellectual and ongoing intellectual development to that in a systematic way mm-hmm. which only I, I felt like really could get through the divinity school there at Duke and uh and which was a great opportunity for me to, to start working on during my residency. Yeah. And, and so one major area that I know you've written about, sort of directly sort of related to this work, is about religion and, and health, about the relationship um, between being a religious believer and certain health outcomes and so forth. Um, for our audience, um, what would you say is important for them to know about reli- religion and health? About the relationship. Well, you're right. It is an area that I have worked on uh, and has been an important part of my own sort of scholarship and academic development over the last 20 years or so after I did my work in the Divinity School. And I, An important segment of that consideration would be then that I did go on to do the Master's in Public Health in Epidemiology mm. at UNC's School of Public Health. Mm. So after completion of the THM at the Divinity School, I, uh, I had some good good mentorship from people like Dan Blazer and others in the Department of Psychiatry who were epidemiologists, mm. and uh, and I was aware that if if I wanted to thoughtfully take this work that I'd been doing in religion and pastoral theology and and ethics and the, this sort of domain that I'd been getting the THM, if I wanted to bring that into the intersection with the research community in medicine. I really need to be equipped to think a little more systematically on mm. with regards to methodological rigor and research uh, considerations uh, on that side of the street. Mm. So I did the MPH in epidemiology at UNC and started doing some of this this work and really through the years became very well and really valued those opportunities. But the issues of measurement mm-hmm. and how to consider outcomes and what, what were the credible and legitimate, quote, outcomes with regard to this interaction and the, this relationship of religion and health became real important to me. And what, what uh, I became quite concerned about what I was seeing happen, that there were, uh, there were a number of persons with good intentions and, and goodwill all in all mm-hmm. who were advocating for a, a vision that was really... I think frequently in articulate in some version of religion is good for your health mm-hmm. and sort of wanting to use standardized health outcomes using re- and then using uh, something like various blood, religious blood variables. pressure or something yeah or, some yeah, kind yeah. some form uh-huh. of, of standardized uh, health outcomes mm-hmm. but then and then using um, then using religious variables religiosity variables uh, and we could go. We could talk at nauseum about yeah. the types of variables that were developed and that were used. Mm-hmm. Some more problematic than others, but the tendency was to presume and try to prove, quote unquote, versus a really very systematic scientific method, but to prove that religion was good for your health. Yeah. And so, and if you look at the epidemiological methods, et cetera, I mean, it's it's, it's not hard to at times come up with an ad a. a an adequate p value to show some sort of relationship. Yeah. Okay, some sort of of be sort of, of like if you go to church this many times then you're well, less some, likely some, to have some version whatever. of yeah. mm-hmm. a religiosity variable mm-hmm. within some sort of a, and if you do enough of those and have enough uh of uh of uh consider you know enough if you run enough examples of that sort of of analysis you'll find some places where there is a relationship, okay? Mm-hmm. Where there's a correlation of some kind, of some sort of association. Okay. Which, that doesn't prove causation, though. Sure. And one of the real tendencies at times was to, to imply at times that, oh, we've got this association, and th- then slowly, or, or sometimes quite quickly, slide into, oh, that there's causation implied by that in some way. I see. So as we looked at that more carefully and mm-hmm. concerned... I became then more theologically concerned as well about the implication of that religion or spirituality was being presumed to be have this instrumental value mm-hmm. that it was in some way well let's use it mm-hmm. let's and 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 implied within that is let's get it right let's get a right spirituality a right 
a mm -hmm. right religiosity done in the right way, mm -hmm. and then it will have this health outcome in some ver in some formation. Yeah, that's fraught with all sorts of complexities, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, and is if if we explore that with some depth, looking at the the with religious traditions and the notions of how I think we can we need to think most rightly mm -hmm. about just the complexities of what spirituality even is about and the and the and then to try to measure mm -hmm. just it, when when we start to think about measuring uh and about to to measure both the religious variables and the spiritual in a way that is uh that is reliable then when you also think about well how do we control for all of the uh, other variables that might be contributing to some outcome of that. We, we do know that in some ways participation in religious communities consistently has an association with some uh, effort, evidence of improved health. Mm -hmm. Not surprising no. on, on yeah. many levels. Yeah. Not, it's not surprising yeah. at all. Um, but there's, an, there's a reductionism involved when you start to imply to start to make the sort of causative claims out of that as if, oh, well, religion is good for your health or spirituality is good for your health. Those yeah. actually do not lead there. And so, and, and it also, I think, distorts both health and, uh, and religion and mm -hmm. spirituality to be making those claims. Because the truth is then that when we look at the outcomes I, I think that we need to be have much richer outcomes we're considering of human flourishing and how to think about that we're all going to die, Nate. Right. Okay? Yeah. And yeah. we're all going to... Uh, the, the reality is we will probably, as part of the human condition, suffer in this life, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. in some way, form, or fashion. Does that mean that one's spirituality or one's religion was not good enough or it was not the right one? Mm -hmm. Probably not. Or not, probably not, but no. Yeah. And, and so... Then how does how does that then challenge us to think more fully and more richly about both religion and spirituality and about health? What is health really about? And that it's much more full than just oh, I no longer have hypertension or I have my diabetes under control. Mm -hmm. That health actually may be a much more full sense of what it means to be part of a community and to live in a way that is still may include suffering, still may include disease, but that might have something more about when we think of the old historic notions of, of human flourishing mm -hmm. and what the good might be in, in our sort of our human purpose that's much richer and much more full than a simple reductionistic view of medicalized uh, notions of, 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 uh, of, of quote, health outcomes, and also that have distorted both the health and the spirituality and religion uh, components in that equation. That's a very, very nuanced view, and, um, I, you know, I, I really appreciate it. And I, <clears throat> I wonder also, too, if, the, if we look at the other side of the coin, I imagine sometimes um, religion can actually be a, a negative force. It can sort of lead to sort of bad health outcomes or something like that. I mean, have you, as, as a psychiatrist, have you had cases where you see religion be problematic in people's lives? That's a great question, a great point, Nate. Of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, inevitably, I mean, there's not some, uh, there, there's not some protective na notion of that uh, all religion will have a constructive or positive role mm -hmm. in people's lives. We've all, most of us who have been part of religious communities for any amount of time know that there are those who start to suffer more in the hands of folks who mean well, but that they, 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 mm -hmm. the, the person starts to struggle more with either guilt, shame, mm -hmm. varieties of, of just seeming like or, or depressive symptoms in some ways that mm -hmm. are seem to be in some ways um, enhanced nearly yeah. by their involvement in a community where they're feeling alienated or that they don't belong. So religious or spiritual communities can be very embracing, giving people a sense of place, 
a place to belong, a place where they're cared for profoundly, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. They can also be very alienating communities. Yeah. They can be very exclusivistic. They can be very much so a community that gives the message of, you don't fit here, mm -hmm. and you're not acceptable. Yeah. You are in some way, mm -hmm. and can, and which can, we, we know then those kinds of contexts where people are not, do not experience support, do not have the sense of a place to belong, et cetera, et cetera, can lead to real maladaptation mm -hmm. and inability to, to adapt to stress mm -hmm. and can contribute to all sorts of health phenomena that are much less than what we would want to maybe call human flourishing or, sure. or, uh, yeah. or thriving. So I don't think there's any question but what religious, the religious life can have a positive or negative valence. And the, but the important part on this in some ways that I want to stress with regard to that is, and, but those are not um, the basis. The, the health outcomes are not the basis for judging or evaluating religious and spiritual lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. a, a classic a, a phrase that I'll sometimes use for, for those of us within the Christian tradition is, I'm not sure where anyone ever thought that a cross was good for your health. <laughs> uh, and yet the cross is central to the Christian tradition yeah, sure. and, uh, and yeah. an understanding of the place of suffering. And, yeah. and so I, th I think we have very naively been seduced mm -hmm. into sometimes the, uh, the illusion mm -hmm. that in some way that the, that the uh, sort of contemporary therapeutic culture of the last 50 to 100 years is uh, is something that should be uh, that in which one can use view an instrumental use of religion or spirituality as a commodity by which to attain this uh, this this health outcome, which is really I think just a, a misguided understanding of religion and spirituality as well as health. Right, that the purpose of religion is not to make you healthy. I mean, that, yeah. where did we get that idea that that was the, I mean, yeah. mm -hmm. it's, and, and some may want to make some reference to, uh, you know, healing miracles uh, by Jesus in the, uh, in, in the, in the New Testament. This, I think that's a very simplistic mm -hmm. uh, linkage there that doesn't leave the fullness of the room for the, also the call within the Christian tradition to uh, to be part of uh, commitment communities of giving and sacrifice to others suffering mm -hmm. and the fullness of of what a flourishing full and quote a life with a, the, a good life mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. might look like and uh, so I think those distortions are are those tendencies and the seduction into those distortions have really have really um, caused a, a lack of, of understanding over the last couple of decades, two to three decades, around some of this relationship. That's just sad to me, to be honest with you. I think, mm -hmm. and I think it really leads to uh, to then uh, the propensity for long term for then when people start to when faithful religious folk mm -hmm. are engaging within uh, healthcare and this, they 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 start to assume well. This should be good for people. You know, they, they start to presume that their version of religion or spirituality is going to be in some way good for the health of others in a way that just uh, that limits, I think, what might be a more faithful vision of a call to commitment to care for those who are suffering. Mm -hmm. not, not with an illusion or vision, oh, and if I use religion or spirituality in the right way, then uh, we're going to get better health outcomes. That's that's I think that's misguided and mm -hmm. lacks the real compelling conviction mm -hmm. of 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 a religious and spiritual tradition from many different that we be through the lens of many different traditions to know for the vulnerable, the suffering, and the frail among us, we're called to care. Yeah. And care is worthy in and of itself. Absolutely. Re regardless of the outcome. Absolutely. And yeah. with the yeah. assumption yeah. that the outcome will be death. Yeah. Because that's a guarantee. That is a guarantee. But yet, sure. but yeah. yet we as religious and peop 
religious communities and people of faith in various traditions, yeah. I think there's a consistency that, mm-hmm. that can wed us to a commitment uh, to care as a practice that really does resonate with the breadth of religious and spiritual traditions in a very rich and full way that, uh, that I think ha- ha- is, is part of the beauty of this relationship we talk about through of religion and health, etc., but yeah. very different than the in- instrumentalized presumptions of of uh, we're going to fix uh, someone and have, and change the health outcomes. Sure, I, I I'm really enjoying this conversation. It's very sophisticated take, sort of on the role or place of religion in the medical context. It's not something we talk about sort of in a deep way, kind of very often on a daily basis with medical students, residents, doctors. Um, I'm curious. You know, you've done a lot of work. Um, with chaplains over the years as well. I'd, I'd like to steer the conversation a little bit in that sure. direction. And um, wh- wh- from your, wh- your point of view, as a physician, as an insider, what is it that chaplains have to offer? Why are they important? You know, that's, that's a great focus there, Nate. And I, I go back to, you know, we were talking earlier about medical school in yeah. some ways in my uh-huh. early formation. And I... I I direct a program at this point in my career called Mental Health and Chaplaincy, mm-hmm. a program for the VA mm-hmm. uh, that I, we're, uh, it's a national initiative for equipping chaplains for uh, service in mental health and to most optimally equip chaplains with evidence-based practices and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and systematic training that, so that they can, mo- can be more involved in mental health uh, Practices is outpa- in outpatient care, inpatient, and ac- really across the board of, of mental health care. Part of the vision for that, and really the the grounding for the beginning of that that uh, that part of my trajectory in my career, started as a medical student when 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 I was in at Norton's Hospital in Louisville on our uh, when I was in my cl- psychiatry clerkship in Wayne Oates was the chaplain mm-hmm. there in that uh, in on that floor in that unit. Uh, at the weekly team meetings, when we review cases, review patients that were uh, when that were had uh, more recent admissions as well as those anticipating discharge, and Jess Wright was I remember all these players. Jess Wright was the medical director, <laughs> and uh, and Wayne was the chaplain there. And my exposure as a young medical student was that Wayne sat at the table, Jess. MD, PhD, very a great, a really good, top flight psychiatrist was uh, would frequently look to Wayne for his opinions, his thoughts on a patient. Mm-hmm. Wayne knew back then it was DSM three, mm-hmm. not DSM five, <laughs> but Wayne knew DSM three as well as anyone, mm-hmm. and um, and but was also just conversant about the patients. He he knew the patients. He he knew. The dynamics of how the, of that were they were struggling with in their life. He was he was he was cognizant of the uh, of of the uh, sort of clinical context as well as their very real sort of spiritual and psychologically dynamic forces in their lives, and was a respected member of the um, of the team. So he was looked to in that way. So I thought, this is the way the world works. <laughs> oh, chaplains sit at the table. They're valued and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and really a, a well-received component of the, of the mental health teams. Little did I know when I went on then into other training settings, et cetera, oh, it's not like that everywhere. Hmm. That's not always, you know, frequently the chaplains, if the chaplain was even in the room, they were sitting back in the corner somewhere and not expected to say much. Hmm. And so that was a really shock to me at first. I yeah. thought, what is that? I, I thought psychiatry and mental health was a much more integrative effort. It, it just seems like such a great opportunity, especially at this moment where my impression of psychiatry residency programs now is that most are biologically based and there's not much training and sort of therapy or conversations and um, maybe that's fine, um, but chaplain. In any case, chaplains are trained in how to listen and how to have conversations. So what you're doing is sort of bringing highly specialized groups, psychiatrists and chaplains together to provide sort of the best possible care. And with the VA population, it's sort of motivated in part because, as you mentioned, 
they're re requesting that. Many of them are religious, and they are requesting it. But I also hear, and what you're saying is that this is not only good, not only for the VA population, but this is something even broader. That this is something. It's a. It's a kind of a lesson for hospitals in general. Not that every patient wants a chaplain or something like that, but that that there's a, a real opportunity, you know, obviously for the VA, but for the, the hospital systems in general. I think, I think you're absolutely on target, Nate. Uh, and we just, we've developed this work in the VA because of their support, which I'm mm -hmm. greatly indebted to yeah. for the support to be, and because of long history mm -hmm. of chaplains, both with, in, the, uh, in the military services and the VA being uh, persons who are less stigmatized. To be frank with you, I think mm -hmm. there's a long history of, of when, when folks are first struggling with emotional or mental health struggles, they don't go to the local psychologist or psychiatrist. They go to the primary care provider or the clergy person. Mm. Those are the persons that have always been the front line. Interesting. And if we're and yeah. we have data that shows that. Yeah. And so if we want to and if we want to honor that and make the most of that, then this mm. is part of that. As well as just it's less stigmatized. Yeah. In in both military service and VA content, and there are many things. There are many opportunities the chaplain may have for. Ex, for facilitating access mm -hmm. as well as entry point just into the life of the veteran or service member that uh, that that uh, others wouldn't have out of mental health. But I think you're quite so. We're very thankful for that opportunity within the VA. But it's a much broader issue, mm -hmm. and I think you're you're pointing towards. A, I'll be a little bolder than you were with regard to you were very mm -hmm. very generous towards psychiatry with regards to the biological mm -hmm. inclinations. We have made great progress over the last couple of decades, too, mm -hmm. more than that, but with regards to our understanding in neurosciences. And it's very exciting. It's very exciting what we're learning and some of the, uh, the progress that has been made. Um, but I think we are falling short to not be sustaining training for psychiatrists mm -hmm. and uh, to, to maintain the most optimal training uh, Possible with regard to psychotherapies, understand, understand both as interventions, but also as models for understanding human nature and human proclivities, mm -hmm. the and just our patterns of living. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we, it's it's much too easy to start to think that uh, oh well we've we have all, we have either we have diagnostic capacities and therapeutic capacities grounded in neurobiology. We don't need to maintain our skills in understanding persons and their human patterns and their human relationships uh, to because of these new therapeutic tools we have. How naive. Mm. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the, I mean any, any good psychiatrist knows that the likelihood of someone being able to understand what they may be struggling with with depression, and even if one is treating them with an antidepressant, and then sustaining the treatment with an antidepressant and getting through the period of side effects and mon that those are going to be more op that one is going to be more optimally uh, the, the likelihood of greater success is much greater mm -hmm. if uh, if that practitioner has a comprehensive understanding of humans, human patterns, relationships, along with the neurobiology. It's 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 a it's sort of a false dichotomy to say. Do we do medication or therapy? It's the best outcome is, uh, is it's both. both 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 yeah. I, and yeah. there's good data to support that yeah and For the thing and and yes you've got psychologist colleagues and others who mm -hmm. can help with some of the psychotherapy but it's 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 much too simple and reductionistic to think that oh well yeah. psychiatrists only need to know the neurobiology and the yeah. neuroscientists know yeah. and so I think you're you're quite right to yeah. point toward. The collaborative, and we can bring multiple professionals together, but we also need to maintain integrated training as well. Yeah, and it's interesting. That I hadn't thought of it before in this way. Your, your point about access, I thought that was a very interesting point because uh, chaplains have access to people's lives in ways that psychologists wouldn't. Psychologists, all, clinical psychologists also are trained to listen, to talk, and so forth, in ways that psychiatrists today um, aren't. Um, but the psychologists wouldn't have the access that chaplains have. That, that, that's pretty. That's a very interesting and, and point. And again, yeah. it, it's mm -hmm. with the understanding that, mm -hmm. uh, of course, there are some persons who don't want to see a chaplain mm -hmm. or don't want to. Uh, but it's fewer than one might think that are. If again, if the chaplain is appropriately trained and yes. and and 
and understands the breadth of mm-hmm. of human sort of existential yearning and suffering mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. that and and re- well we have a lot of really well trained chaplains across this country that have a lot of uh, of training with clinical uh with CPE mm-hmm. and other modal and other mechanisms of, of training to equip them to to care for persons in a, a really thoughtful ways that I think address the concern you were just pointing toward. Sure. Thank, yeah. That's 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 great. Um, tonight you'll be talking about um, moral injury. Um, can you can you tell us what what you mean by the term moral injury and, and why is it why is it important for medical students? Well, moral injury is actually a, an evolving and relatively new construct. Okay, that uh, that really came the the two persons that have contributed most to the uh, to the sort of development of the language and our sort of basic kind of definitional knowledge are Jonathan Shea and Brett Litz. Jonathan Shea was a psychiatrist. Brett Litz, a psychologist, both of whom have worked around were early. Uh, uh, idea generators around the idea of that in so, on some level, and this these come out of of the uh, exposure to military trauma in some way and military experiences where a person has has either been uh, been part of in some way an event or an experience in their military experience where they felt like they fell short of what would have full, been consistent with their uh, previous understandings of their moral identity and moral being, or that in some way they bore witness to that and were unable to intervene or to be an agent of of uh, of change to the context, or that they have suffered from a, 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 a and Jonathan Shea gives more of a, of adherence to the notion of that someone a superior has betrayed them. In some way, and they have and they have been in essence uh, they have been betrayed by someone uh, in their upline who through de- either decision made or not made that left them vulnerable to experiences, behaviors, or exposures that have uh, that have uh, that have, have are in conflict with their understandings of what would have been. Uh, Mm-hmm. Uh, a moral behavior and, and right behavior on their part, and so I, I think the 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 place that we have understood it most fully is more in military context and expo and uh, and experiences in war. Mm-hmm. That's where Shea and Litz have both developed their ideas the most. But I but I you were asking about yeah, where that, medical students it, would be yeah most relevant. It, let me let, let me make sure I understand uh, that just a military example. Would this be, you know, um, an example of moral injury if a commander uh, tells you to go in and conduct a certain military operation in a village and you end up killing civilians right, and something like that, and then afterwards, well, let, is let, that, me, yeah. let me give you a couple of concrete, if that's helpful for you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. A couple of concrete examples would that uh-huh. that would that would give insight into both of the parameters, the betrayal mm. and the experience of one's own behaviors. Okay. One one would be as straightforward as that when you're confronted with a twelve year old on the street in front of you and you uh you don't know whether he he is uh he basically is in in the role of wearing a suicide vest mm-hmm. and coming toward you in some way and you're unsure, and you end up having to make a judgment call, and that leads you to to uh, to killing that twelve year old. Mm-hmm. And then you find out later that he actually was innocent, and there was not a concern with regard to your to threat to you. Mm-hmm. That's a classic example of someone then struggling with what have I done? Yeah, who have I become? I killed a twelve year old. Yeah, uh, and and. And you you may have a twelve year old at home, yeah. And so you're so that's one that's one example in just in a, yeah. a, in a straightforward fashion, and struggling that, with you know. what have I who am I now? Yeah, I'm, I'm a child killer or something like that. that yeah, that kind of struggle. Another example would be then when uh, when you're being there is a village that that's that needs to be uh, that needs to be. That you're going to have soldiers going into 
to basically uh, because they're, they're, that area needs to be in essence uh, controlled and managed and you've got two possibilities one is to go in door to door and you don't know whether there are armed persons there that were that are part of that are, would engage in armed conflict or not and uh, there's a vulnerability to your soldiers that you're you're, you're a, let's say you're a leader a, a mid-level leader and you and you're you're having to make the decision about whether to send your soldiers in to for uh, for door-to-door combat or whether to call in air power to basically clean out that village. I mean, you the whole ba- village. You yeah. basically yeah. just clean out the village, and mm-hmm. then that will mm-hmm. and and you're going to uh, to make that then much safer for your soldiers to go in. But you're also you realize that you may be putting innocent civilians at risk sure. by doing that. And so the so you, you've got to make someone has to make that decision, and the people above you say uh, just really opt out and say I, we don't, you're going to have to make that one that was yours to make we don't have any we're not, we're not going to we have no input into this that's yours to make mm-hmm. well then you're at that mid level as a leader and then you make you make a decision and either way you can imagine where there are but let's say you call in the firepower yeah. and you clean it and then the next day you go in with the soldiers and everyone there were women and children Mm. There was no, there were no really armed combatants there. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a degree to which you've got struggles with regard to what have I done mm-hmm. in my decision making, but also you're angry and feel betrayed by those above you who really didn't participate and left you without any, uh, any, any for, uh, mm-hmm. ancillary data or assistance in trying to make such a decision. Mm-hmm. So you can imagine where you feel betrayed by those above you and you and at the same time you're also feeling like what have I so what have I done? I've I've, I've killed multiple women and children mm-hmm. uh, unnecessarily but I had to make a decision, had to make a choice. Do these yeah, do that's these give perfect. you some sense of yeah, so all of yeah. those may be examples of moral injury in in a war type context, but I think the potential for thinking about moral injury is much broader yeah. because I think there are a lot of places in our society where persons are put in positions where they're making decisions and being participants in decision and implementation of decisions that they have tremendous uh, moral and emotional conflict about and that they really feel like that wasn't what I came into this to do. I didn't under, I, I did not plan to be doing this mm-hmm. when I came into even something like the practice of medicine. Yeah. And so, then they end up frustrated and concerned and also feeling betrayed by those who were above them. Yeah. I, I can see the parallels because uh, the military obviously, obviously is very hierarchical. And medicine is too. You know, there's people above you making calls and so forth. So what would be some, like if, if you could offer examples of moral injury in medicine where people have to make these decisions, it seems like there's two wrong decisions or something, or or, 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 or or they find themselves asking, what have I become? What have I done? Uh, I think what, and again, I'm not saying that the intensity is the same as a war context. So sure. I, I'm not meaning to imply that at all. But yet I think the principle of, let, let's just take the, the young medical, the medical student who really came to medical school because they're, they have all the idealized, hopes and and vision for what it means for them to be a doctor someday and to be involved in the care of people who are suffering caring cure healing the, the entire the entire work of, of medicine and and that's really and, and they and it is admirable in all of their expectations with that then they're in a clinical context where they're caught with what they're finding is they're being expected to, to be a primary agent in getting a patient out of the hospital and back out on the streets with limited limited discharge planning, not because people are bad people, not because anyone in the scenario are bad, but there are limited good options, mm. limited good options. Mm-hmm. But then, but then there, so there's a push to get someone back, uh, to get someone discharged and out of the hospital. And at the same time, they're feeling, and, and the medical students feeling like that, he or she is being asked to be an agent in that process, and that they're feeling like 
the this the uh, the advisory and supervisory structure above them is just giving that mandate. We've mm-hmm. got to get them out. We've got to get beds. We've got to get more beds available for other people who are needing to come into the hospital. So at the end of the day, that medical student is feeling, and this could be a medical student or a young resident. Mm-hmm. It could easily be an internal resident. Is feeling like, what have I done? I mean, I'm, I'm finding myself that I'm, I'm putting people back, I'm putting homeless people on the street mm-hmm. when we don't have any good options. Society has let me down by not having good options for the care of these persons. Mm-hmm. Uh, our administrative structure is limited on its options, but I'm just getting the word, got to get them out. And what have I become? Mm-hmm. What have I become in the midst of this mm-hmm. that I never thought would be what I would be called upon in the practice of medicine. That's just one, yeah. one example. Yeah, and how, how can we help these medical students or, or residents? Well, you know, I think, Nate, any, in any situation, I mean, the, and this may seem overly simplified, but actually I think it's a pretty important one, whether it's the, the young, whether it's folks in medicine or whether it's the young veteran or service member, whoever. Mm-hmm. I think we have to find places to talk honestly. Mm. We have to find safe places Mm -hmm. where people feel like they belong Mm -hmm. and they feel like there there is an ability to tolerate and accept the emotional turmoil, Mm -hmm. the emotional feelings. Not to try to say, oh, put that away, that we can't talk. No, a safe place Mm -hmm. for those for those conversations. And for them to, and then to allow that, there the journey's ongoing. Mm-hmm. The journey doesn't end here, but that we can live with those, we can hold those, mm-hmm. we can hold those, and that, but that that there's a place to hear about it, to talk about it, and to keep looking at alternative ways and, and considerations. But a generosity of no, you know, mm-hmm. welcome to the human community. Where we are less than uh, yeah. we yeah. than we wish we are. Then we will always be less than we wish we were. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. Uh, but you're there's a place here for that and for the feelings that you live and struggle with. And I'm over I'm overly simplifying, but I hope that makes some it make it sense makes a lot you. of sense. And it, it it's sort of like on the you know burnout. I think there's lots of reasons for burnout and. You know, I, I I could see putting moral injury as kind of one contributor to burnout, but I I, I I tend to think of burnout as a structural issue regarding sort of time. You know, people just being pressed with um, uh, so much work to do, and uh, so much you have to enter, do the notes after shifts and so forth, and um, you know I can see talking being limited there, but with regard to moral injury, it, that seems to apply like even if the physicians had all the time in the world that moral injury would still occur. I think so. And so therefore talking, like having a safe place for talking becomes all the more critical, I think. That, uh, what, I, what I'm hearing and what you're saying is there needs to be spaces where these experiences of suffering can be reintegrated into the fabric of their lives, I think. And well, and without the assumption that they can be, uh, uh, that, that, that they must disappear, mm-hmm. or that in some way they've, that they have to be uh, stomped out. Mm-hmm. No, I think they're going to be, the, with the com- and even with the burnout issue, I understand what you're saying, but mm-hmm. I think the complexities are more than you might. It's just more complicated than time. Yeah. And I think I, I do think that I, I don't. I agree. I, I don't agree. think. Yeah. I don't think yeah. it's just. Time. No. I think the yeah. reality is that it's it's more complex. Yeah. It's more and frequently what maybe gets verbalized as well. I'm just too pushed. I don't have time. Maybe because that's safer to say. Mm-hmm. When we start to say that we're that we're not sure about what we're doing, yeah. or that it's not that it's not quite what we understood healthcare was going to be about. Yeah. Uh, 
that's pretty. That can seem a little bit dangerous. That's interesting. That can seem yeah. a bit threatening. So that the the common sort of reason for burnout being cited is time, but you're suggesting that that might even be a cover. Right. Well, yeah. not not conscious cover, but right. I mean just yeah. yeah. It's because it's well, it's to yeah. to really start to dig down. Yeah. And look at mm-hmm. some of what may be contributing. Mm-hmm to a sense of what gets called burnout. I don't even use the language myself, to be honest with you. But sure. to what can feel like is just, in some way, it's, a, it's there, the stresses of, of the practice, of the care, of the work mm-hmm. of medicine, have become uh, unbearable on some level. And, and to mm-hmm. a certain, I think there are many contributors that sometimes we're, are, 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 really, are rather threatening to name, yeah. and that we aren't, we aren't sure about what to do. Mm-hmm. And so it can nearly feel like if I really start to name all of this, is it too hopeless? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think all of those kinds of, of 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 experiences and feelings in those contexts need a place, to, a safe place to be talked about. It's interesting. And so, like, where where is that place? The question would be, yeah, where do doctors go for help whenever they're sort of talking about? The problems of medicine. That's interesting. Where are those spaces? Well, you know, yeah. we don't have good options. Yeah. But we, yeah. I think there's a challenge there to, uh, to be intentional yeah. about developing ways and context in which one of, the, one of the things we do in our ethics program at Vanderbilt, of, uh, we have a session for fourth-year students around medical errors. Mm. And, and when we start that off, I have a younger colleague that works with me in that session. And when we start that off, one of the points I always make is, it's not a matter of if, mm. it's when mm. you make a medical error. Mm. Hopefully they'll be minimal. Hopefully they won't be too severe. But I mean, we all make errors. We d- and how to deal with that? How to, how, where's, where's the place to deal with the fact that I didn't get it right? Mm. I, and, and that there were consequences, potentially. Hopefully minimal, mm-hmm. but potentially consequences for a patient. Mm-hmm. Of my not getting it right, not of, of making some form of error, uh, we need a place. We need to we need to be more intentional about offering structured structures yeah. within uh, medicine yeah. where that can be talked about safely. Where that and and various institutions have ways of doing this, mm-hmm. but I think we need to. It, it is I think it is one of those uh, examples of things that we could more systematically acknowledge, talk about, and develop ways that we uh, share with one another around how we do those things. Yeah, and it, and it seems like centers like yours, centers like ours, we the, these can be places where these conversations can happen and Absolutely. and should happen and um you know, um I'm I'm just so grateful for the work that you're doing and um I really appreciate you uh making the time to come down to Houston and uh, being with our students and um it's, a del- it's a delightful to be here, Nick. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Matter. Thank you. Oh.